Hello brothers and sisters, I'm your sister Nikki Brazel and I'm here with a dream and an understanding given from the Lord. This dream occurred um, early May 2021, I don't have an exact date, and the title of the word is Wake Up, O Sleeper. Since you claim you can see, your guilt remains. And so um, I'm going to tell you the dream and I'm going to give you the understanding given. Um, in this particular dream, um, and I want to say it happened in the early morning hours, so maybe 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. In this dream, I can see myself and I'm also in the dream operating. So I have a bird's eye view. I can see myself and then I'm also operating in the dream. In the dream, I am in what looks like to be a beautiful waterfall that's coming out from behind a building. It looks to be an institutional building, maybe a um, institute of higher learning, maybe a private school. Um, a very posh boarding school maybe and at the back of the building is a lot of heavy stones and of course this waterfall and pool area is all made out of white marble and there are beautiful grounds and grass and trees and birds it's a beautiful garden something maybe you'd see in Europe and I am standing in um, a, a shallow pool of water um, very very beautiful water and there is water cascading down it's a waterfall um, I'm wearing, wearing a white kind of Roman Greco Grecian kind of gown with a belt that is encircled silver like different little chains really beautiful belt that's holding kind of up the the bottom part I would say the leggings were like a pantalette and the dress was kind of long but split at the side it was very and it was white and um, in the dream the waterfall the cascading waterfall and the, um, I want to say marble kind of slide, it kind of looked like, just like a, kind of the way it cascaded down was made out of marble and water was rolling down that as well. They were part together, they, so they were both sides of it. So there was one side, this side was where I was standing, it had a pool of water and water cascading. And the other side had what looked like, kind of like a slopey little, not something a person would slide on per se, but maybe. And that was where water was also cascading down. Now, um, in the dream, I can see myself and um, that I'm standing in the water, and I'm, I'm really excited. I'm looking all around, and it just looks so beautiful. And I know that I have to um, get ready to cover this uh, slide, the other side, with this clear plastic. I know in my spirit that the water is going to stop flowing and that I need to cover it with this plastic. Now, the plastic was on a really large roll that was up at, um, at the top was where it extended from at the top of this building which is maybe like four or five stories up all, again all stone very very beautiful with moss and just green and lots of grass and birds chirping and stuff but the plastic was was actually pulled forth and it was a little bit to the right kind of just hanging down more um, to the edge not on the ground but I was going to go ahead and grab it and cover it up so I can see as I look out over right near not inside the pool of water or on the waterfall but in the ground on the grass is my sister and she's just wearing regular clothes and this actually was a dream of my real life sister my next sister down from me she's standing there and I turn around and so I can see myself do this and I say to her I holler down I say I have to um, the water's gonna stop soon this is exactly what I said thank you Holy Spirit the water's gonna stop soon and I need to cover the waterfall with the plastic so it doesn't get dirty and get leaves on it and stuff and grass when the water stops so because it would get stained you know like a white marble if water wasn't continuing to run and then grass and leaves went on there it would stain it so I say that to her and she immediately scoots forward and grabs the plastic and jerks really hard this long piece of plastic that's what that I'm fixing to get and kind of cover it up well when she jerks it it comes unrolled from the roller it unfurls from up top and it's disconnected and it goes onto the ground and because it had a little bit of spray on it which was just water it's now wet and it's hit the ground and it's got leaves and pine out needles on stuff and it's dirty now so now I know I can't use it and I'm talking about three or four stories of plastic like height wise this is not just four feet or five feet this is very tall so I, I'm so shocked that she does this, I can't believe this, because she's completely ripped it from the roller. And I am I look down at her, and I'm like, why did you do that? And of course, she looks at me, and she just gives me a look, an unapologetic look, like, it's what I do. I'm, I'm so, like, I can't believe she's done this. So I gather up the skirts. I have this, you know, pretty long, pretty long dress, like, in top, and it has leggings underneath it. But I don't want to say leggings, because they were more loose, loose 
pant kind of situation um, underneath the skirt because the skirt was kind of slit at the side. So I gather that up and I tie it up and I tuck it into this belt of silver, chained silver, like encircle it. And when I say a circle chain, I mean it had like these larger and it was very gilded like with diamonds. So it was a very, very beautiful belt. Not something I'd normally wear, but this belt. So I gather up the skirt on both sides and tie it very efficiently. And I remember in the dream thinking, wow, I must have done this a time or two because I was very efficient at it. Like, And I leapt. I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, I leapt <clears throat> four or five stories, three, four or five stories up high to the top of where this this water this waterfall is to go and examine, you know, I got to get more plastic. I got to get a better piece of plastic because I know that I still have to cover up this waterfall because the water is going to stop soon and I need to cover it with the plastic. When I get up there, I find that the roll is completely empty. She's jerked it loose. And so I'm thinking, well, you know, I'm going to go through this window. There's actually a window up there. I better go through the window and look and see if there's more plastic and go ahead and do what I'm supposed to do. So I'm, I, I'm thinking, okay, I, you know, I'm holding on right here because it's barely a little ledge. And, um, but I'm going to need both hands to open this window because it looks painted shut. And it's a little small window. It's maybe mm, it's three feet wide, but it doesn't look very tall. It's maybe 12 inches tall, almost like what you would see in older fashioned schools and older building and stuff. The windows that were way up tall at the top part of the building. Well, right away in my spirit, I, I hear the Holy Spirit say, well, just pull it with your arm. It'll open. Well, I don't have a very strong shoulder, so I'm thinking, but in, in real life, I don't. So I pull it and it opens. And I look down, and it's quite a drop from where I'm at on the outside of the building on this little ledge where this, with this marble waterfall. It's a good nine-foot drop. And I remember saying to myself in the spirit, good thing I'm six foot tall because if I weren't, if I was a shorter person, there's no way I'd risk that jump. So I climb through and jump down. I land on the ground in what looks to be, like I said, an institutionalized school. Maybe a private school, maybe a... Uh, Definitely like a boarding school, a private school, somewhere where education takes place. And so very fancy education, I'll say that. It's not just your normal everyday school or public school. Right away, as I land, I notice to my left, and this is a wider hallway, one of those like maybe you might see in a high school, you know, something like that, not an elementary school, very narrow. I notice right off to my left, a little dark form creature scurrying right down the hallway. And immediately my attention forgets about the, the plastic and that I need to cover up because the water is going to stop soon. I take that, um, I start, I say, oh, I'm going to go see what that is. It's this dark, like little scurrying. It's a shadow. I can't see if it's a creature. It's low to the ground. I don't know what it is. Immediately it runs down this hall. And so right in front of me is this really wide hallway, much wider than a normal hallway, like a hospital that wide. Um, and I see a stairwell. And so this stairwell is the kind that you would see in high schools that have three and four stories. And so it has a wide, very wide stairwell. And at the edge of the stairwell, there's windows, you know, that look outside, but there's also a little ledge. And on the ledge of the stairwell are bed frames, metal bed frames without mattresses, and they're standing up. And they're on a several sides of it. And I remember thinking, like, why are the bed frames there standing up? It seems like if a lot of people were going down the stairs, those could possibly fall on them. That's kind of weird, but... I noticed it, wasn't too worried about it. I was the only person there on this floor, and I still want to make sure that I catch this scurrying, figure out what this scurrying thing is, you know, what's going on. My, my, my spirit is intent to go find out what that is. So I go down the three flights of stairs. I go downstairs, and I walk down a long hallway, and the hallway starts to curve. And as it starts to curve, as I'm walking really quickly, still following this scurrying creature, this shadow creature, I, I notice to my left that there's a classroom and there's children in it and there's another door and it's open and there's a courtyard almost like the school has its own courtyard inside of it you know where I was at was like maybe the backyard of the property or the back area where all the fields and everything were and all the gardens and things this is almost like an inside courtyard of a place where the smaller children are playing and I hear little kids playing and I can tell they're outside and I hear a teacher teaching well Having been a teacher and I love children, I immediately stop a little bit and I think, oh, I want to look in there and see how that courtyard looks and how the classrooms are set up. This is this is like a nice school. Immediately in my spirit, I hear, don't stop right there. I know you're interested in there. Basically, I get the impression, I know you're interested and you want to look, but you need to keep your mind on what you're doing. So, okay. So I, but as I'm passing by, I do see this. It's a little curve in the hallway. It's now curved. It's not straight. And I can kind of see, and I think, wow, there's a courtyard, and there's kids playing out there, and they're having a great time. There's other kids in the classroom, and these are all younger children, um, I would say definitely under 12. Not that this school doesn't have older children, because I get the impression older people are there, too. So um, maybe all the grades. 
So I go back down the hall, I continue down the hall, and I, I see the, the creature scurry in like this double wide door. Shadow creature, I don't know, it's low to the ground, corner edge, I don't know what it is. I can't say it's a person, I can't say it's a beast, animal, I don't know what it is, but it's clearly something I gotta check out what it is, it's not something good. So it goes um, straight through these double doors. Well, as soon as I catch up to it, I go, I see, as I get to the double doors, that this is a kitchen, a commercial grade kitchen, exactly what you'd see in like a private school. It's a commercial grade kitchen. I can see the tables, the kitchen, kitchen uh, cooking equipment. It's a kitchen where food's prepared. I can see that. As I begin to step through the doorway, because now I am intent, I'm like, I'm gonna catch whatever that is. I'm gonna catch whatever this dark creature is. As soon as I step through the door, I wake up. Okay, so that's the dream. And here's the interpretation that the father gave. Okay. And all the scripture references that I give, they'll be in the description box, okay? So anytime someone brings a prophetic word from the Father or an understanding from the Father, there should be scriptural references given. If there aren't, that's a red flag. There will always be scriptural references because the Father confirms himself through his word, okay? So um, this is when I sought the Lord. That morning when I woke up from the dream, I kind of had a little bit of understanding, but not all of it. So I sought the Lord. Um throughout the next few weeks, but I have to tell you, and I had to repent of it, I didn't seek him as much as I could have because I kind of felt like I understood the dream and it specifically involved my sister, and so I didn't like some of the understanding. I was bothered by it, so I just kind of left it alone until the Lord brought it back into my remembrance today and put it on my heart to come and bring a video. And so I repented of that, and I'm sorry, brothers and sisters, for my late arrival on this, but it involved my sister. So this is the understanding the father gave. The white marble waterfall and grotto represent an area of washed clean. So the waterfall, you know, the water pouring over us is the washing of the Holy Spirit, uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit. So standing in the waterfall in that grotto, that beautiful area represented um, being washed clean and standing there clean. Um, my sister standing in the field below, not in the water, represents not washed and unclean. Um, this is a hard video to do because this is actually really my sister. I don't think she'll probably see this video, but she could. So please bear with me. Um, my sister standing in the field below, not in the water, represents not washed and unclean. This particular sister is not baptized in the spirit of repentance, but does claim Christ. She represents worldly Christians as referenced in John 9.41. The water shutting off soon that I say to my sister, I say I have to cover this marble up because the water is going to shut off soon. Um, the verse is Acts 2.17 and um, this water shutting off soon represents the closing of the dispensation of grace and that the call to repentance is closing. The Father has given a call to repentance for a while for all the children in the world and it's now closing. You remember in Acts uh, chapter 2 verse 17, the Lord says that in the last days he'll pour out his spirit and your young men and your old your young men and you will dream dreams and your, your old men will have visions or basically there'll be prophesying on the youth and that there many people would come forth and say that he was coming which is exactly what's happening now and of course um, this doesn't only just represent my sister this represents most of the lukewarm church who claim Christ but don't see his coming they don't understand that he's coming Number four, my sister yanking the covering represents her denial of the truth and denial of the work I'm called to. Her look when she yanked the covering was one lacking remorse and actually was defiant, as if to say, hey, it's what I do. It was open defiance, unapologetically against the work and a move of God. Um, this represents many in the lukewarm church who deny the movement of God right now in this hour. Um, he's doing a mighty work and he's moving mightily on the children. He is pouring out his spirit. So it's very sad to see this defiance and unapologetic mean-spiritedness against the work of God because that's such a beautiful thing. Number five, my leap to the top of the waterfall represents the great escapades the elect bride will do in the last days. The white garment I was wearing while standing in the pool of water represents being the bride of Christ. The pool represents being washed clean. 
and it's referenced in John chapter 9, the pool of Siloam. The word Siloam means to send, which God has done. He has sent many of his children to go and speak on behalf of himself to tell the world that he's coming soon. The standing bed frames with no mattresses represent the time for sleeping is over. The scripture given is Ephesians 5.14, Awake, O Sleeper, and he encourages that you read all of Ephesians chapter 5. Number 7. The chasing after and searching for the dark creature that scurried along the wall low below and down the stairs represents generational curses that have so easily beset our siblings in this hour. And their denial of the work God is doing has caused a distraction for the elect bride. So that I remember I was putting the plastic up, but then I saw this. And the only reason I saw this creature inside the school was because the plastic had been pulled. And just right now, as I'm recalling it, the Holy Spirit's letting me know, because it was a school, right now the Lord is sending forth his teachers to, to teach his word and to teach what's going on. And, and, and because the kingdom of hand is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is drawing near. And so he has called people forth to speak on this. So the bed frames represent that um, it's time for everybody to wake up. It's time to stop sleeping because in the Bible, the 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 Jesus, the Lord always equates sleeping in the scriptures with either death, which if you're not alive in Christ, you are dead, and also with not being awake, not understanding what's going on. There are many that are asleep in this hour. They have no idea how soon Jesus is coming. He's expected any minute. The chasing after and searching for the dark creature um, represents generational curses, and the fact that it was in a school represents that the father has given one of my other sisters a teaching about spirits and spirits that speak, and then myself, uh, both of us, our calling is to teach on that, how the enemy is speaking and tricking the lukewarm church, and so um, that's why it was in an educational or school setting, um, because, because of the teaching that he's given. And there are generational curses that are causing people to deny, to be unapolog unapologetically in denial about the move of God. The classroom I passed where class was happening, my spirit observed it, but I knew to keep looking for the dark creature. It does represent my calling as a teacher and my calling as a generational curse breaker. The curses my sister is caught under are the same ones that have held many people captive in my family for generations. And just as the scripture says, I'll visit the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. These are the same things that held captive, you know, generations ago, grandparents as well. Thank you, Jesus. My mother's been released and one of my other sisters. So there are some still in our family that I'm an aunt. There are some people still caught under these generational curses, but we're breaking them in the na mighty name of Jesus Christ. But this is what that represented. represented. The dream ends as I walk into the commercial kitchen of the facility or the this this really what I think is a private school. Kitchens represent food. And Jesus in the scriptures declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Amen. Alleluia. My entering the kitchen represents having been fed by Christ on his word. Upon seeking the Lord for further understanding on this dream. First of all, I want to say this. It wasn't that I was praying and just like, Lord, give me the answer. I want, I want to make it very clear that I am a sinner and not perfect like me. I am not perfect. Only Jesus Christ is perfect. Um, the Lord brought it back into my remembrance of the dream. And he kind of was like, hey, you know, you had that dream a while ago and we need to clear it up. So um, he's the one that brought it back because I, I really felt like I had the understanding and, and, and didn't really want to know anymore, to be honest with you. But upon seeking the Lord for further understanding, because he put it in my heart to pray about it, about this dream, I was shown that my sister represents those who claim Christ but do not believe his word or works. Like the religious Pharisees in chapter 9 of John, who did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God, nor did they believe he had healed the blind man. Although the blind man told them many times, and then even grew weary of their unbelief, lukewarm Christians are like these Pharisees. They claim God, but deny the miracles, signs, and wonders that follow those who believe on Jesus. Um, the fathers asked me to read um, chapter 9. It's really quick. It won't take but five minutes, and I pray you'll bear with me, brothers and sisters. So my sister represents this lukewarm Christian, 
that is denying the move of God right now. They're denying that prophecy is coming forward. They're denying that this great move is happening, that dreams and visions and that he's giving words to people. <clears throat> and there are many people caught in the in the lukewarm. Jesus is love. Everything's fine movement. And so, of course, they're, they've been deceived. The church has has deceived them they've been deceived so this is the this is the chapter and verse that the lord would like me to read and it's um chapter nine in john and at the top of the page it says pool so p-o-o-l pool of siloam and as jesus passed by he saw a man which was blind from his birth and his disciples asked him saying master who did sin this man or his parents that he was born blind Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and said unto the blind man, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam. He went his way, therefore, and washed, and came seeing. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him, that he was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He looks like him. But he actually said, I am he. He answered, Therefore they said unto him, How were your eyes opened? He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. Then said they unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. They brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. They brought the blind man to the Pharisees. So. They brought the blind man. The Pharisees are the religious people of that day. You're Christians that you have today. The Christians that go to church, or maybe they don't even go to church every Sunday, but they claim Christ. So the, these Pharisees claimed God. They didn't claim Christ because they didn't recognize him, but they claimed God, that they knew God. So they brought the blind man to the Pharisees, and um, since it was the sab and it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees asked him how he had received his sight, and he said unto them, He put clay upon my eyes, and I washed and do see. So the Pharisees knew it had been the Sabbath when Jesus had healed the blind man. And so, therefore, some of the religious, and I'm going to say religious folks with the Pharisees, because they are this one and the same. Therefore, said some of the Pharisees, the religious people, this man is not God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. So they were saying, Jesus is not of God, because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. So some of the Christians at that time, some of, and I won't call them Christians, I'll say those who professed God, some were saying, well, he doesn't keep the law, he doesn't keep the Sabbath, so he can't be a man of God. And others were saying, well, how could he even do this miracle if he wasn't of God? So <clears throat> there was a division among him, just like there is right now a days with the Christians, lukewarm Christians, and those who are following Christ, who are seeing these signs and wonders. They're seeing God make the blind see. There is a division. So there was a division among them. So they say unto the, they said unto the blind men again, What sayest thou of him that he hath opened thine eyes? And so the blind man answered and said, He's a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked them, the parents, saying, Is this your son who ye say was born blind? How then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we know not, or who hath opened his eyes? We know not. He is of age. Ask him. He shall speak for himself. These words spake the parents because they feared the Jews, the religious people at the time. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that it was Christ who had healed the man, he should be put out of the synagogues. Just as the lukewarm church is dismissing those followers of Christ who have had a change in their life and have been healed and are claiming Christ did it. 
they've been put out from the churches or dismissed from those friends and family who, who don't receive it in any way. So, so his parents said, you know, he's of age, ask him. Then again, they called the blind, the man that was blind and said unto him, give God the praise. We know that this other guy is a sinner. So they were very upset and they were like, give God the praise. Don't give the praise to Jesus. So he says to them, whether he is a sinner or no, I do not know. One thing I know that whereas I was blind, now I see. They then said they to him again, what did he do thee? What did he do to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and ye did not accept what I said. Now, wherefore, would ye hear it again? Would you like to be his disciples? So he was being a little bit sarcastic, like, you keep asking, but you don't accept what I'm saying. So he's kind of using sarcasm. Are you wanting to be his disciple? Then they insulted him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. And the Lord showed me that this is likened unto the, the, those sisters and brothers who have been awakened and called as the elect and called as the chosen to give teachings about the coming of the Son of God and the things that God's speaking in these dreams and visions. Many Christians, they're, they're not receiving it. And they're like, oh, they just don't believe that's of God. And so they'll ask plenty of questions. But when you keep saying it's Christ who did it, they'll argue, they'll argue against it. And But then they'll still say, like they said here, well, you're his disciple, but we're Moses' disciple. We know that God spake unto Moses, as for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. Now listen to what the blind man says. The man answered and said unto them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing, that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. He was saying to them, you know, this is, this is, this is just quite astounding. This is quite astounding. You claim God, but he has opened my eyes. This Jesus Christ has opened my eyes. And you're saying you don't you don't you don't know where he is, where he came from. He did a miracle that only God could do, but you're saying you're saying you don't recognize it. Listen to that. A miracle has happened. We see it, but we're gonna deny that it came that he's God. We're gonna deny that it came from God, that he is God. So then this man says, Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. So he's now preaching to the Pharisees, to the religious folks. He says, Now we know that God hears not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? Since the world began. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, You are all together you were altogether born in sin, and does you do you now teach us? And they cast him out of the synagogue. So basically they called him a liar. They were like, Well, you're born in sin, assuming that his his physical frailment had been because of his sin, just like the apostles had asked God, is this you know, or had asked Jesus, had asked the Christ, who is God? Was this because of his sin? Is he blind or because of his parents? And he said, neither. It's for my glory. So they cast him out of the synagogue, just like the lukewarm church has cast out the elect, the bride. They're trying to share these truths. They're trying to say how Jesus healed them, and nobody wants to receive it. So Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he found the man, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and, they, and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin, but now ye say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. The unbelief of the religious of Jesus' day and today is the same. It is a spirit of unbelief and must be repented of. Otherwise, those who say they can see but are indeed blind, will be counted among the sinners. 
Their guilt of sin will remain because they claim to know Christ, but do not recognize him. Um, there are many scriptures that the Father cited, and I'll put them in the description box. Uh, brothers and sisters, um, I know that many of you that will come to this word will have someone in your life. Maybe you've been speaking to them about repentance, about maybe dreams and visions or words that the Father has given to you. And I know maybe in your heart you're also feeling so, so saddened by the fact that maybe it's a close person to you that's denying this move of Christ. And uh, they're denying the prophecy. They're denying that things, things are happening. And God has, has told us that there's a season for everything. And there will be many that will be taken later throughout the tribulation. And that will we require that the bride elect be raptured. And then that they will see that before that they'll repent and realize the time and season they're in. Just like the Pharisees and the religious folks. Though Jesus stood right there, they just couldn't receive it. They just would deny who Jesus Christ was. And that we see that today. There will be many who will be watching this video who are the bride elect and who are um, maybe having a difficulty sharing with their brothers and sisters what God has been speaking to them. And then there will be some that watch this that think they're the bride elect, but they're in fact the lukewarm church. To you, to that group, I want to speak to. Four years ago, God came into my life and showed me that was an idolater, that I was an idolater. He washed me of my sin, he baptized me in the Holy Spirit, and he revealed to me the calling that he had placed on my life was to share what had happened to me, and that it was to call forth the lukewarm church, to call them out of their lukewarmness. Um, and at the time, I had, I was so grateful that, that, that I had not died, I had almost died, um, I had almost been shot and killed, and I was so grateful because I knew that God had given me the understanding that had I died that night, I would have went to hell, and so I had been given a second chance. And so I was so excited about this mission and this calling that God had placed in my life, never knowing how difficult it would be to convince Christians, lukewarm Christians, that they aren't saved and they actually aren't redeemed and that they're working with a false doctrine, a false gospel, and they're not really not redeemed and that they are just like the Pharisees and the religious folks. They are not seeing the move of God. They're saying they can see, but their guilt remains because they're saying they're not blind, but they are in fact blind. And so it, um, and I, it's been interesting because I really thought, well, this is just going to be the easiest thing ever because once I tell people and explain to them, because I was so relieved that I had been given the second chance, I was so grateful to God that I hadn't died that night because I would be in hell because I was someone who said they could see, but couldn't. I was really, in fact, blind because I called the name of Christ, but I was not walking with Christ. I was not seeing the move of Christ that had been happening for the last decade. I was completely unaware of it because I was so caught up in the world. And so I really um, am so grateful, and I was so grateful and continue to be so grateful. I had no idea that it is, I heard a preacher say one time, it is easier to convert a prostitute than a lukewarm Christian. It is easier to convert a prostitute to Christ to convict her of her sin and convince her of her sin and, and, and convince her that she needs a savior than it is for a lukewarm Christian to believe it because they have been bought, they have bought the false doctrine, false gospel of a false church for so long and they believe it. It's easy believism. I myself was caught in it myself before the Lord showed me that I had to pick up my cross and follow him. And so I just pray in Jesus' mighty name that this word goes exactly to the, whoever needs to hear it, that the Lord send it forth. I pray that the Father anoint the ears of the hearer and that he touch the heart and the open your understanding in your heart that if this is you and that if you are the lukewarm church, that he, that he grant you repentance and that you understand how serious it is the time that we're in. Brothers and sisters, we are very, very close. Very soon the elect bride will leave. And not everyone who is called in the name of the Christ, that, not everyone who has said, Lord, Lord, will enter in into the marriage supper of the Lamb. That is what the scriptures say. So even though the church has told you, all who call in the name of the Lord shall be saved, the scriptures say that many on that day will say, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name, we did these great works. And he will say, go away, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. That time is fast drawing upon us, brothers and sisters. As you can see, we're in the end days. The mark of the beast has already been released. So I pray in Jesus' mighty name that we all repent and that we all spend this time walking away from earthly desires. And that um, I pray that you take this dream and this understanding before the Lord and ask him to give you more understanding and more depth in it. And that you pray for everyone in your circle, out of your circle, all the brothers and sisters all throughout the world so that more people can be brought into the kingdom of God. I love you all with an everlasting love. Um, this, world, this word was difficult to give, of course, but 
by the blood of Jesus I got through it and I, I pray that you'll help me to pray for my sister as well that the Lord will grant her spirit of repentance and that he will call her into his marvelous glory and call her into light we were all caught in sin before and I know that he is doing a marvelous move at this time and so I just bless his holy name again and again and I pray that he make his countenance to shine on you always brother sisters in all ways and I just thank the Lord for each one of you and thank you for joining me and I pray this blessed you in Jesus mighty name amen and amen